Hello and welcome to the first Access Chat of 2019. We're delighted to welcome Dr. Joanna Brighton today. Um, Joanna is a reader in computer science at the University of Bath and has uh, some really interesting things to say about robotics and artificial intelligence. These are things that we think and we know are going to shape the future of, uh, of inclusive um, technology, um, but they're also going to have a profound impact on society in general. Um, so, welcome, Joanna. Can you tell us a little bit more about yourself and and, and your work, and uh, is, oh. yeah, so, <laughs> and, and in particular, you know, we can start the conversation about um, the impact of AI on inclusion. Sure. Well, uh, I guess I should say hi. Thank you for having me. Uh, it's an honor. Uh, my, I guess I'm an academic and I work in the area of trying to understand intelligence generally. So my first and third degrees were basically psychology, but the scientific end of psychology. And then the second and fourth degrees were artificial intelligence. And that was because I was a good programmer and I knew it was one of my strengths um, and I wanted to get into a good school, but also that I actually secretly was really interested in, in intelligence. So, um, and so uh, I wound up doing a PhD at MIT, so my strategy worked, but, um, but it was kind of, uh, again, for a psychologist going into computer science at MIT was a bit overwhelming. And so what I did my PhD on was actually the systems engineering of AI, because I had been a professional programmer. So what is systems engineering? It's about um, how do you actually build things and make sure that it works, make sure that it's safe, uh, how can you document accountability, things like that. So uh, systems engineering is a big deal in computer science in general and actually in all kinds of building. I mean, it, it predates computer science. However, it hasn't been a big enough deal in AI because people expect AI to program itself like kids do. Well, actually, no kid programs themselves, all right? <laughs> There's like four billion years of biological stuff that sets them up in a place where they can learn. And then anybody who's a parent knows there's a lot of other time put in, but but people are somehow oblivious of this. And um, and so anyway, it was a wide open uh, field and it still is, unfortunately. There's still not enough people really working in systems engineering of AI um, and, and calling it that. Actually, everybody who works in uh, systems engineering in computer science is of course aware of AI and has been incorporating uh, AI techniques for decades. Um, but anyway, so that's what I was doing for my PhD. What I actually was concerned about was uh, understanding really blue sky questions about what is intelligence, what is cognition, why do some species use it um, more than others, why do some individuals use it more than others in different contexts and these kinds of things. And then um, while I was working on these sort of two things, I kept the, the engineering thing going partly so I could keep doing my own work uh, and, and have better tools, but also because I was in a computer science department, I had to sort of legitimize that. <laughs> um, the, uh, well, actually starting back in my PhD, I was at one point working on a robot that was shaped like a person and didn't work at all. It wasn't even plugged in. And people would walk up and say, oh, we owe ethical obligations to that robot. Um, you know, it would be wrong to unplug it. And I'm like, well, it's not plugged in. <laughs> then they'd be like, well, if you plug it in. And I'd be like, well, it doesn't work. I, I couldn't understand why people thought they had obligations to the robot, this particular robot. I was in a room full of robots that really did work, like older robots that had already, you know, their projects were over. And it was the robot that was shaped like a person that people thought just that shape indicated that they had obligations to it. So I think there's a big, there's a huge thing in here. Um, uh, most, but not all people in human rights feel uh, as, as I do, that this is a, a huge indication of a, uh, a misunderstanding of what it is that deserves uh, ethical concern, consider, ethical concern, right? Um, but some people feel really strongly that I don't get it, and that of course intelligence is the magic bit that deserves uh, um, uh, attention. So I don't know if I should uh, go on at greater length about that, or if you want to talk about that in Q and A. But basically, trust me, there's all kinds of intelligent things that we don't care very much about, like rats, um, like, like calculators. Um, and it, it is the ones that remind us of being human that we somehow just then attribute intelligence to, um, or, or not just intelligence, but, but also uh, humanness and therefore uh, what's called moral patience, obligations, ethical obligations. 
I, I think wow. that's really interesting because <clears throat> the, um, you know, there are um, food sources, things that we eat that are more intelligent than the robots we've created right now. Uh, and, and whilst some people get, you know, very, um, <laughs> um, have great, great concerns about this. And obviously there's the whole vegan movement and, and animal rights. A lot of other people couldn't care. Um, uh, and yet this whole anthropomorphization of, of robotics then causes us to focus and care about something that, that really doesn't have that much of intelligence at all. I think that's it's well, really interesting. It's, it's really important. Well, again, what is intelligence? Let, let's go there in a second. But I do want to say dehumanizing is the flip side of anthropomorphizing. So so as soon as you're saying that oh, something, this robot is, is more human than, I don't know, a rat or something, um, then you're, you're sort of rejecting part of the human experience because the rat has more of the phenomenological experience like pain and things like that, right? Um, I, I was gonna say about the intelligence, right. Uh, it, I, I actually don't have, pro I mean, there's lots of different components to intelligence. And so, you know, books have better memory than we do. If, if they're written on decent paper, they'll last longer than a hundred years, right? Um, Google search, you know, or any search, even Bing search knows way more than any individual human, right? Um, your calculator can do math faster than you. Your phone can probably play chess better than you unless you're some incredible chess player. Um, it, what does it mean that the robots aren't intelligent? It, again, it's not the intelligence that's the thing that makes, that makes ethical obligation. So this is hugely controversial. The question is, what is it that, then? Um, one thing might be that, uh, that it's irreplaceable, right? Each person is unique, um, whereas if we are careful with our phones, we can back them up. And so it doesn't matter so much. If you lose a phone that isn't backed up, then that's a problem. You've lost a bunch of information. Maybe it's important information about your relationships or somebody else's medical records. I met a doctor who lost their phone once, you know, that kind of problem. Um, but I would say then it's not so much that we owed an obligation to the phone, as the person whose phone it was had an obligation to their own memory that they should have been backing up their phone, right? Wow. But so that's, a, that's the kind of confusion we can get into, yeah. Right, and, and the, first of all, I, I just want to applaud that you're a woman in technology. So yay, yay, yeah. I love meeting brilliant women that are really changing the world. But I, I and we were talking before the show and uh, you brought up some really good points that I want you to bring up during the show too. But uh, uh, we talk a lot on Access Chat about, um, and I also have another program called Human Potential at Work. What does it even mean to be human? So now we're often talking about the empowerment of people with disabilities and sometimes people born or acquiring disabilities in their life, different disabilities, um, society will look down and say, I, I've had people say, oh, the worst thing that could ever happen to me is if I went blind. And I'm like, well, really? That's the worst thing? Are you sure? Yeah. Anyway, so do we even know? So when you're talking about intelligence, what does that mean to humanness? And am I combining things? And, and I know we're just figuring this all out as society, but how, how do the two work together? What does it mean to be human? Like the example that you and Neil were talking about with the rat, you know, we know the rat has a lot of, that's why we do scientific experiments on rats because that we can make assumptions about human beings. But how, can, can we tie those two together? Yeah, no, so, Part of what uh, science is about, this is such a great set of questions, but we, we could literally spend like an entire degree talking about these questions. Um, part of what science is about is understanding what kinds of things there are in the world. In fact, that's also philosophy, it's called ontology, right? It's, it's finding out what kinds of things are in the world. And so sometimes the words that we were using uh, turn out not to be adequate. Um, so let me give you a simple example uh, in uh, contemporary European languages. In English, we have two words, conscious and conscience. So conscious is sort of awake and aware. Uh, conscience is telling you what's right or wrong. In Italian, there's only one word for both of those, and it necessarily has religious overtones. Okay, so it's like uh, the concepts are broken up different. Okay, 
intelligent, a lot of people use intelligent to mean human-like, and they assume that there's all these things that come along with it. But if I use the word intelligent as uh, I was told, actually, in my degrees, both my undergraduate degree in psychology and my master's degree in artificial intelligence, I was told, look, in, um, intelligence is being able to do something appropriate in a context. So being able to perceive a context and respond to it, either to deal with uh, opportunities and threats, okay? That's a definition we've had for like 150 years, and it's pretty clear. You can see which animals are more able to adjust to uh, new challenges, right? So the people will tell you, we don't understand what intelligence is, okay? That doesn't make sense. Intelligence is a word, and we choose some subset of things to define. All right, and I just gave you a perfectly good working definition that we've used for 150 years. If people tell you, I don't even know, you know, no one knows what intelligence is, therefore AI is impossible. What they're really saying is, I'm afraid that you're going to challenge what it means to be human. I think of intelligent as meaning human-like, and I refuse to allow you to make a machine that challenges who I am. All right, wow. to be brief. Yeah, good. <laughs> okay. Wow. So, so uh, I think there there is a big issue about what is it to be human, um, uh, and, and especially I mean you know when you think of really uh, 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 severe uh, disabilities and and when people are making uh, decisions like end of life decisions and things like that, um, there, there's there's huge questions and and I'm I'm not. I'm, I'm I do some moral philosophy, but I'm not a trained moral philosopher. I can't go all the way down. But I can, I can tell you that I have a really interesting, different perspective than most people who talk about this with respect to AI. Because of what I just told you, because I understand intelligence is just a trait, um, I, I can say, look, we have all these intelligent things. Some of them are artifacts. What does it mean to be AI? It's you're intelligent and you're an artifact. Okay, and I shouldn't say you in this context, actually. <laughs> so there's something that that, what does it mean to be an artifact? It means it was deliberately built, okay? And so rather than saying that, that it's impossible to have artificial intelligence you have obligations to, I say it's a bad idea to build artificial intelligence we have obligations to. Because obligations are a way that humans have figured out how to coordinate our actions. And as you just mentioned, it is super hard to figure out how much obligation we have to each other. So why complicate that? by creating machines that need obligations. We can say, look, if this is a legitimate commercial product, then it has to be backed up, right? For example, right? It has to be replaceable. It has to be mass produced. Um, otherwise, we would be in a situation where we might have to choose between saving the robot and saving the child. And I think it's a completely legitimate thing that we should demand from, uh, our, from our, uh, our robot makers that we should have to make that, that choice, that, you know, that, that, the, that the robot only costs money, um, but otherwise it's completely replicable. Um, now, of course, some people will make arts that, art that is robots, and then you, but that's just the same as a painting. <laughs> Again, that's, that's an individual one-off thing that, that you have other issues with, which are the same as art, okay? I know Antonio no, has a question. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Were, <laughs> you were talking about the phone, the phone being backed up. No, uh, today, you know, we don't need a, an agenda. We, we don't need to memorize uh, like we had to do in the past as many numbers. So the phone itself has become a device of assist, assistive technology mm, know, in, in a certain way. Yeah. So how, how do, you know, when you, you know, you have the chance of talking with very smart people, a lot of smart people around the world working in this field uh, and debating this type of topic, how do you see, uh, upcoming technology uh, being able to help individuals, uh, no, in this case, individuals with disabilities, and somehow also empower and amplify our own senses where we can use technology in not only uh, no, to be more efficient, but also to be part of, no, of the community, to be, just to be able, able to communicate. Yeah, okay, great question. Um, Again, uh, at the extremes of this question, we're going to get into an area which I am aware of, but not an expert in, which is human enhancement. 
So a lot of people are more comfortable with using technology to bring people up to some norm than to push them beyond that norm. Um, I have to say personally, and I only found out this recently, when my vision is corrected as it is when I have glasses on, I actually have better than average vision, right? So I didn't realize I was one of those people that was being corrected above the norm, but that was just because my main problem was an astigmatism. So it's either way below norm or somewhat above norm, okay? Um, so that's just an example of that I'm not sure that that makes sense to talk about, you know, cutting off at some line of, of where you can bring people up to. But um, having said that, let, let, let's pull back into my comfort zone, which is that there's no question artificial intelligence is massively uh, enabling. I mean, there's I, I've read, I haven't had the experience, of course, but I've read uh, people talking about how amazing it is to take their phone out and, and you know, somebody who was, say, blind from birth, and suddenly for the first time they go outside and they can tell that it's a sunny day and what color the sky is, whether it's blue or gray. And they feel so much a part, more a part of human society, which is wonderful. You know, I, that's great. And, and certainly for me, uh, I'm not very good with languages, but I, you know, I'm no longer afraid to just walk into somewhere and we'll get, we'll make it. If we have a phone and we have signal, uh, then we're gonna, we're gonna be able to communicate. Um, and, and similarly that we, you know, I'm not afraid of getting lost in cities and I, I might take uh, mobile, you know, public transportation sooner than I would have otherwise, all kinds of things that might be good for the ecosystem. At the same time, will it make everybody the same? Well, <laughs> There's two problems there, um, and this is, I think, that conversation you mentioned from before that you want me to bring back. Um, one is that it's not, it's, you know, however wonderful it is to be a part of humanity and know that it's sunny or not, it's not the same as actually seeing everything. That you don't, as I said, you, when I have my glasses on, I see a little more than the average person, right? You know, we just don't all have the same amount of information we get when we go outside, all right? The, um, but secondly, there are cases where artificial intelligence of various kinds are bringing us all to the same uh, level. And what that does is actually reduce wage differentiation. Now, I just, just made a big jump into how much you get rewarded uh, for doing your job. And you might think, I mean, Mark said that everybody having uh, the same wage if they put for the same effort is, is an ideal, right? But um, let me give you the case that, that we were talking about before. Uh, this is the case about uh, truck drivers. So some people say, oh, we, you know, don't be afraid of driverless cars because actually there aren't enough drivers now. We can't find enough people to drive trucks right now. They're all, the, all the people who still do it are old and they're retiring and nobody wants the job. Okay. Well, but what's really going on there is that in the 1970s, uh, you know, corrected for inflation, truck drivers made 50% more money than they do now. And why is that? Well, again, if you're thinking AI is a human, then you don't, you won't think this is AI, but there's this thing called power steering. And if you believed my definition I gave earlier, that you're transferring, you're, you're recognizing the context of the steering wheel and then transferring that into changing the, where the wheels are going. It used to be a physical process. Now it's done by automation. All right. So now it used to be that to be a truck driver, you had to be a very strong individual. It was mostly men, occasionally women, but it was big, strong individuals who were also smart enough to be able to schedule their time and good with maps. You know, not everybody is good with maps. Um, now you can have spreadsheets, you can have um, GPS, and basically a lot more people can drive, which is great. It's enabling, but it means that job is no longer a high paying job. All right. And so there's some really interesting questions about redistribution when we use technology to make everybody more equal. Of course, it's better than the people who couldn't drive at all if they couldn't find any job, I suppose. But th these are very complex questions of political economy. And um, uh, I, again, I'm starting to move into trying to learn that area, but it's, it's very complicated. And my feeling is that nobody's really sure what's going on with wages. <laughs> As far as I can no, tell. No, so, so, no, that you touch a very interesting point, and and go, going back to the to the to the truck drivers, because you know today we see a, a large number of articles talking about uh, the future of jobs and how many is jobs are going to be lost, but this is something that has been happening in the last fifty years. Yeah. It's not something. Well, no. So so 
What's your point? How do you, how do we bring this to reality? And this is something that is happening now. This is not about the future. You know, what are our views on that? Yeah, absolutely. I think that, again, this over-identification with intelligence means that people didn't recognize artificial intelligence until it got good at things that we really feel as very human, like face recognition, eye contact, and uh, language, you know, spoken language. I think that's why suddenly, because we've just recently got good at uploading that, you know, those human abilities into machines, now people feel like, oh, AI is here. But it's been here for a long time. Automation has, and we can look at the patterns of what happens when you bring automation in. Um, and generally, everybody is better off. <laughs> if you look at, on average, I mean, not everybody, but the, but even at the, the very poor, even in, in America, where we have terrible health care uh, in terms of, uh, I mean, we have great health care at the top, but terrible uh, payment uh, across the, the bottom. But even in America, over the last 20 years, the, the very poor have gotten better uh, health care. Globally, we've seen uh, extreme poverty, like 4 billion people move out of extreme poverty in the last 15 years. And a lot of that is to do with, um, actually, with mobile phones. I mean, AI is only part of the information communication technology revolution, but it, but it helps you access all that information. Anyway, if you're a person living in a small village in the middle of literally nowhere, having access to what is the weather tending to do? Um, how much will you get paid for things? I'm sorry, I got to suspend that. Speaking of technology. <laughs> Speaking of technology. Sorry, I, I, I hope you guys can edit. <laughs> okay. So, no, but we, we all get it. We all have that happen. I'm sorry about that. Um, going back to, where was I? Uh, uh, I was just kind of... Villager with the mobile phone wanting to know about the weather. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They can know what they're, they basically can find out what products to grow and what a, what a fair price is. And that changes a lot, you know? Mm -hmm. And so, um, so technology has helped a lot of people. You can look at very basic things like infant mortality. And in most countries, infant mortality is dropping. Unfortunately, right, not right now in America. Um, yeah. But that, that's probably political not not technological um so the uh yeah infant mortality is a infant mortality is a basic thing to human happiness we really want babies to be alive and it's one of the best predictors of, of government failures if if uh state failures if if infant mortality starts increasing um so on these on these we we know that we get more wealth but but we also know that we have periods of uh um you know genocide yeah <laughs> right so right. So it's not that it's not like it's simple. It's and and a lot of it is political. A, a, a comment to what you to some of the stuff you were saying, Joanna. Um, I know that I, w I was having a um, a conversation with um, someone that uh, Neil and Antonio introduced me to, Maylen, and she's just this brilliant woman, and she was telling me that. The United Nations used to go in, or or the Red Cross, or anybody going in to help uh, people that were in trouble for whatever reason, and they would say, "What do you need? What can we do to help you?" And they would say, "Well, we need water, we need clean food, we need clothing." Now, when they go in and say, "What can we do to help?" They're saying, "We need Wi-Fi, we need the internet, <laughs> we need because a lot of them, even as refugees and stuff, they will have the devices. They need the devices to get themselves out of the situation." And that's very empowering and very hopeful, but there's so much misunderstanding about artificial intelligence. And I, I was looking at, the other day I was on Twitter and this man said, um, somebody that I don't know, but he just made a comment that he was no longer supportive of <clears throat> driverless cars because of the the driverless cars, people looking at AI, they just were totally ignoring the mental health aspects of it. And I thought, oh gosh, I could go in my brain a million places with that, but I was curious where he was going with that and he didn't he couldn't really elaborate on it but and i also think it's interesting joanna you have all these wonderful degrees and you're obviously a very brilliant woman and learned and you're saying i've been taught intelligence means this but what you're also saying is that's what we thought 
that's what the experts thought, but there's a lot of it that's still, once again, what does it mean to be truly hum, human? Uh, th there's so much happening right now. And then on top of it, we're doing the artificial intelligence and the narrow AI and the, it, it's, it's the intensity of it all is pretty overwhelming. And you're, so you're going just, down so many directions there. <laughs> yeah, well, I know because that's what's happening. They're yeah, yeah, all going in so many directions. Let me, uh, let, let me um, so I don't let me forget to come back to the mental health and driverless cars that, that part, but let me say quickly again when you say the, the point I was trying to make about intelligence. Um, and also both both the word intelligence and also AI is that some of these things are just tools that we use and we construct. And so arguing about the real definition of intelligence is a not a good thing to do. <laughs> All right. There isn't any one definition. Words are used differently at different times and by different people. You use a definition to have a conversation and you need to fix it for the beginning of that conversation but you don't necessarily say now all of the world is going to use the word that way. That's not the point. So you need to discriminate between the tools that you're using and then the effects you're trying to have, the conversations you're trying to have. So deciding, you know, which people are you going to help? Hopefully all of them, but which people need how much help? Those kinds of questions. I would say those are the fundamental questions. And then you use, you know, tools like AI and the word intelligence in the way that is most useful to achieve your fundamental goals. Okay. All right. So, uh, <laughs> the, the, um, yeah, the, I'm going to come back first to the driverless car thing and the mental health. Uh, we mentioned a little bit earlier about the fact that, you know, people say, oh, you know, humans will always be the creative ones with relationships or whatever. But in fact, taxi drivers are again, hating their jobs now because they don't get to use the creativity that used to make them unique. They aren't the best navigators. The GPS or even the customers with their phones being annoying <laughs> is telling them, you know, what is the best way to get wherever? What is the most efficient way? Where are there accidents right now? You know, they no longer get to use their minds as much. So there's a mental health aspect there that might have been what they said. But I wanted to tell you that uh, just one of the few real big arguments I've had with somebody, uh, I can't say it's a few arguments I've had on the internet, but the few arguments I've had some, with, over disabilities. Uh, somebody was very angry with me um, because I was just saying as a, as a fact, I was just stating that um, we will not allow driverless cars on our roads until they have significantly lower accidents than humans do. Now that's just an observation of, of what all the governments are saying. It's how it is. So for example, with adoption, that you have higher criteria of being a parent by adoption than by, you know, <laughs> by bio normal biology. Um, and it's because when the state becomes responsible, they have more higher cost to accountability. So that's why they have to have that kind of margin that helps them. Okay. Somebody got really angry with me for just stating a fact, thinking that it was what I was saying should happen. Um, and they were saying that, uh, that I wasn't being sufficiently sensitive to the needs of, uh, the, the disabled who need these driverless cars, you know, they, they, so they can be, uh, independent. And this is a really interesting question because is the driverless car ever going to be cheaper than hiring a, a, a human and, and a conventional car, right? What is this meaning of need? So there was this very strong belief that, um, and I understand it. I understand not wanting to feel obliged to people. People are special. So I understand this and I learned this as a roboticist, right? There are people that will use the most awful robots to help them, you know, drink beer because it's so nice to be able to drink beer, even if it's really slow, without having to say thank you after every sip, you know, the people that are paraplegic. So I get that. But, um, but I, I, I also just think that there's a pragmatic economic side of this and legal side that sometimes, again, this is about negotiations. Artificial intelligence in some ways isn't really changing anything. It, it, it's bringing technology closer to uh, stuff that we, the fundamental problems we already had that maybe we weren't uh, aware of before. And you just see a lot of engineers suddenly finding out about, you know, the field of political economy or the field of, of moral philosophy, right? They, the, those things were there and people argued about them for, for centuries, millennia. Um, 
but it wasn't something with a computer science degree you necessarily needed to know. I think that's I think that's fascinating. Um, you you talked a bit earlier about um, phones, you know, and and objects being things that should be replaceable, and and you would back them up. Now, yeah. um, I, I'm really interested because we 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 covered some of this kind of to these topics before in some of the discussions we'd had within our scientific community at, at work, and we were looking at things like transhumanism. And uh, yeah, I'm interested in, in what your views are around sort of, you know, there's a, Ray Kurzweil, for example, is a big proponent of, you know, singularity and backing himself up to the internet. And, and at what point, once you've backed up your brain, I don't think it's possible yet because it's not possible to back up all of your experiences and your 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 sort of uh, chemical reactions that go in your into your body and your physiological stuff. But at what point does your humanity become digitized? You know, where is that crossover point, and and um, what does that mean for us? Well, that's a really good question. Um, <clears throat> So uh, everything we've talked about up to this point was basically facts, or at least what I was talking about mm -hmm. were basically sure. facts. Now I have to go, there, <clears throat> when you have science, you have descriptive things. So you have to be yeah. based in uh, you know, evidence in, in the world, right? Something that's testable. When we talk about things like how much, you know, how much, when, what is really, is it to be human? It turns out there isn't a scientific fact of that. That is a normative thing. That is something that we negotiate with each other. So now I'm gonna answer your question. I know we're getting towards the end anyway. So I will answer your question um, because uh, more philosophically. So this is this is not, not to make a negative, but just saying this is something I can't prove, but it's my recommendation. Um, uh, I think that there is something very essential to our intelligence that basically everything that we care about is uh, that we're consciously aware of is stuff that helps a bunch of apes stay alive in on this planet, right? There's a lot of things that are grounded in our physical experiences. Um, our, our desire to live forever is part of our being alive, right? That's part of the project of life, right? And and so so we're different in that we're aware of we have we have stories about our our drive for life. But you you can see you know bacteria drive for life right <laughs> so it's it's part of that whole program um, so uh, if you are I'm not going to go into theology here if you are you'll have different set of answers but I I don't think that there's a lot of coherence you can get and I and I really worry about the consequences because oh, sorry I'll finish that sentence. I really worry about the consequences of people believing that they can upload themselves into computers. Um, the, the, and now to some extent, there, it is great when you write your book and your book is gonna survive you. you know, maybe people read it thousands of years from now and that's some kind of achievement. And that is some part of your intelligence and it is some part of your experience that's been put out there and you feel like that's a, that's a great achievement. Other people think it's a more important achievement to make some people happy in their own family today, right? You know. And, and you can have those discussions about, about how you want to allocate your resources. But when people think that a computer um, image of themselves really is them, I think this opens the door for all kinds of corruption. And I really worry about the consequences. I think it's really important, uh, life has found it very important that we keep making new individuals and we, we replace the old with the new. And it, it is painful. But it's uh, but it's also wonderful. Again, we find joy in in in, in infants and things like that, you know, and, and and in the and in the the passing on. Um, and I what I really worry about is, you know, people leaving a lot of money or power to like bad AI images of themselves because they don't want to die, or just because they continue enjoying the exercise of power. We already have people that write wills that say, you know, if my wife remarries, she loses all the money, you know. They're, they're, they're wanting to execute power over their family, continue bullying their family or whatever, after they die, right? So that's something that, they, that makes them feel more secure, right? I really, really worry about AI being used that way. 
I think it's fallacious to think that that we uh, we can just be reduced to um, to pure code and that and that have even our our uh, somewhat uh, uh, or extremely compromised physical experience of being human. I think is part of the essential part of being human. Um, but again, like I said, this is philosophy. This is normative, and some people feel very strongly that I'm wrong. Um, but I, but I, going back to the facts, I do think it's a fact that uh, people will exploit each other and tell each other that that um, you know this is really you and try to get your money <laughs> for for mm -hmm. this you you know uh, sorry different kind of you <laughs> e y o u <laughs> yeah. um, so uh, that, I I think that is a real concern. And so what I, I actually wrote a paper in 2017 with a couple of legal scholars called uh, uh, by foreign of the people or of foreign by the people. I've forgotten. Anyway, but I should know my Lincoln, but the legal lacuna of uh, synthetic legal personhood. So. So we've made very strong recommendations that, that strictly AI systems should not be made into legal persons because of this corruption, this potential for corruption. Um, it's basically AI could be the ultimate uh, shell shell company, <laughs> you know, because you want, you're not going to dissuade it when you can make infinite copies of it, right? Yeah. Oh, wow. Antonio, I, yeah. I, I know you have got a comment. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you have touched uh, different areas from from religion to engineering to so social sciences. No, today you know we have many organizations trying to develop systems and bring AI, you know, uh, uh, to co in in a more commercial way and and sell services. How do you see the importance of uh, the teams who are building all these systems? Uh, how diverse they need to be to bring all these different perspectives to the way how they build system, how they build things. Uh, well, that's a really interesting question. Um, uh, I need to say that uh, I, I personally am atheist, but I've been really impressed by uh, a few, not everybody, that, uh, uh, but uh, theologians that I've worked with on panels who really saw how um, you know, they, they were used to studying the flow of power through human society, and they really saw those points I was just recently making about how different organizations are using people's fears and, and, and desires for eternal life and things. To, uh, to 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 uh, to do smoke and mirrors, right? So I guess it should be that theologians should be very aware of that kind of thing. Um, all we uh, can do is work uh, for diversity. Uh, the University of Bath is trying to put together a center of doctoral training that is interdisciplinary, and I know other organizations are doing that too. Um, certainly, uh, that's part of the reason I do this kind of thing, and I, I've, you know, a lot of people are aware that they need to put together panels that that um, come from a lot of different backgrounds. But uh, personally, I, I will make a recommendation, a slightly risk, risky recommendation, but certainly for me, having a psychology first degree and then uh, uh, artificial intelligence second and third degrees, well, second and fourth, anyway, it doesn't matter. <laughs> But the point, psychology, everything is about being able to understand people. And I had liberal arts, actually, so it was only sort of two years of psychology and two years of, of everything, humanities, physics, whatever. So we're getting this again, I'm sorry. All right, I have no idea what's going on. I'm sorry, let me... Uh... It's okay, it's just Ray Kurzweil telling you that... Uh... He's really yeah, no, the meeting was at, at 11, so we've run over. That's the problem. Yeah. Oh, okay. okay. So. All right, yeah. so we have to we have to finish. So I hope if you have more questions along those lines, uh, ask me that next yeah, week. Yeah. No, that, that's that's grand. I just want to say it's been great to have you on. It's been a fantastic conversation. I need to thank Barclays and my Cleartex for continuing to support us and keep us going. Uh, thank you very much, John. We look forward to you joining us on Twitter. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> okay. See you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank okay. you. Bye. I better go and answer the other call. It was my next call. So my and, next and meeting. Send us some sample questions. Okay. Um, well, yeah. why don't you guys come up with something right now, and then and then I'll I'll weigh in on it. So so send me right. the, the. I think I, I mentioned a few there, but yeah. Okay. okay. All right. See you. All bye. right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Yeah, bye.